So I, I, we have a lot to talk about, uh, but I want to start by bringing you back to your time at law school. And I will just say, Secretary Raimondo uh, is such an amazing person that she forgot this was her 25th <laughs> graduate. She, she said, I just did it because you asked me to. And then I realized it's my reunion. So welcome back to your 50th and your 25th. I wonder if you might talk a little bit about your memories from law school, uh, something special that you remember. So Secretary Clinton, if you don't mind. Well, Heather, um, it, it is so wonderful to be back here at the law school and to have this chance uh, to be with you and Gina. Um, you know, I'm reflecting back. I started in the class of 1972, and then I took an extra year um, studying at the Yale Child Study Center and doing uh, clinical work at uh, Yale New Haven Hospital with medical students. So I actually graduated in the class of 73, which also happened to be the year that Bill Clinton graduated. So there was a little bit of a personal reason for me to uh, pursue my other interests. Um, but in, um, in the class of 1972, um, those were the years that, you know, former Dean uh, Goldstein uh, described as the dark ages of Yale Law School, some of you might remember. And it was in part because there was so much student turmoil and really national turmoil about all kinds of things, including, uh, you know, the Kent State um, uh, killings and it had a profound effect on our class, on the entire student body. Um, it led to us going on strike, um, not taking our exams at the end of uh, one of the years, um, and having to come back and make all that up. But it was a, a time of great turmoil. Um, so I have memories of uh, being on a bucket brigade when the International Law Library was set on fire uh, memories of um, literally um, the, all of the stores boarded up because the Black Panthers were on trial at the courthouse uh, in New Haven. Um, walking down the hallway um, when a large man in a, a camouflage jacket uh, dropped out of his jacket what appeared to be some kind of a weapon I mean, it was a very fraught time, and it's almost impossible to convey uh, that, although I do tell students today who uh, get similarly fraught about many of the issues and problems and challenges going on in the world that I do have some uh, recollection of uh, a similar time. Uh, so in addition to those rather startling memories, I have, you know, lots of memories of wonderful friends, of long conversations in the dining room, um, of classes that were filled with vigorous discussion, uh, a lot of uh, back and forth on everything you can imagine, uh, and a lot of friends who I made in those years who I um, still uh, value so greatly. So. It, it is an incredibly rich uh, time in my life uh, here at the law school um, from which I took a lot of lessons uh, that I still, you know, think about uh, today. Secretary Raimondo, could you remind us about your time here? Thank you. Uh, so I was here, I guess, in a uh, happier or easier time. I, I was here in the late 90s. Uh, uh, I graduated in 98, and by far my uh, happiest times and memories were my friends. And when I walked down this aisle here, seeing all of you guys, it was just a rush of joy and happiness came back to me. Because one of the things that's so special about Yale is the smallness. And so I knew, I think, every single person in my class. I'm still in touch with many of you. And, um, you know, in fact, when I was elected governor, I reached out to Stephen Pryor, who's here, and I said, you got to come work with me. And I came to New Haven uh, to recruit him to do that. And every time, I mean, every one of you has been tapped way too many times to recount to give to my campaigns. Thank you. Um, 
But it's just the smallness of the school was so special for me. I knew pretty early on that I did not want to be a lawyer. And maybe that's why I had more time to socialize than most. <laughs> but um, the friendships that I made and have kept have been just so special to me. And so that's my most enduring uh, memory of my time here at the school. So that's actually a perfect segue to talk a little bit about leadership. So as you know, because you've both been instrumental in founding the Psy Leadership Program, uh, Secretary Munda, you were there. I think I told you maybe the third or fourth person about this idea. Yeah. Secretary Clinton, you kicked us off in what had to be the most glamorous launch of a program in Yale history by coming to speak at it. But I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your own leadership style and how it's evolved over time. And, and if there's anything you drew from your time here that influenced the way that you lead today. Uh, so I'll, I'm going to cold call in reverse order. Secretary Raimondo. Um, thank you for the question. I first want to say this. And I don't know if there are any current students here or younger people here. In my judgment, it is impossible to look around the world today and not come to the conclusion that we need more women in positions of leadership. <laughs> So, and by the way, Dean Gherkin is doing an extraordinary job here. I love your work. Love your work. Uh, and your focus on service. It's phenomenal. So I just want to begin with that because every one of us in here, and Hillary has dedicated her life to this, has to ask ourselves, what are, how are we going to make it so that more women can be running countries, companies, schools, universities, and great institutions? Because it's necessary. Uh, my own style of leadership, um, I, had been the go I was governor for six years, and now, of course, I'm in the cabinet. You know, I try hard, and I learned this as governor, to be very focused on the needs of the people that I serve. And I keep that in the front of everything I do and then use that to motivate the people who work for me. So now I have about 50,000 employees. As governor, it was closer to 20,000, but of course you're leading the whole state. And I find that if you can have a clear vision that relates to the serve, in my case, service, that vision unites and inspires, if you do it right, it unites and inspires everyone who works for you and who you want to follow you. Um, and so when I took office as Commerce Secretary, it was kind of challenging, because the Commerce Department, you may, you may actually wonder, what does the Commerce Secretary do anyway? Turns out you run the Office of Space Commerce, the Weather Service, all export controls, semiconductors, uh, fisheries, I mean, it really, a patent office, trademark office, it's quite a broad array of, of things that I run. And so I have, the unifying theme I have decided is around U.S. competitiveness. I want everybody, no matter what you do, if you're focused on climate or patents, how is your work going to improve the competitiveness of the United States? So our uh, workers, companies, entrepreneurs can out-innovate and out-compete. And so I find that when you have some unifying vision, it's very helpful uh, as a leader. I also led my state during COVID, and I think I became a much more compassionate leader through that experience, just really listening. You have to listen before you can be heard. Uh, and so I've, tr I've become a better leader since that, just being a better listener, more compassionate, more empathetic to the people I serve, but also for the people who work for me and with me. Well, I certainly agree with the first thing that Gina said. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> You know, I've had a very uh, fortunate set of experiences in um, my uh, life of uh, service and leadership and the you know, not-for-profit advocacy uh, sector, obviously, in the public sector I've served on public boards of corporations, seen leadership uh, and been part of that uh, in a different context. And it is absolutely the case for me 
that as a young woman interested in service, and I never quite equated that with leadership when I was here at law school. I went to work immediately out of Yale at the Children's Defense Fund, and my goal was to really be an effective advocate, um, using the law as a way of trying to affect uh, power and how best to uh, create greater opportunity for a greater number of people um, over time. And so you, I really had to learn from some excellent mentors like Marion Wright Edelman, um, also a graduate of the Yale Law School, how to do that, how to be kind of on the outside but influencing what went on in Congress or the White House and, and other uh, places where decisions were made. I also learned from um, my law practice, because I practiced law for um, quite a number of years uh, in Arkansas, um, you know, how different decisions were made in many different settings. Because um, I practiced, I was a litigator, I had all kinds of cases uh, in many different uh, settings, and so trying to pick up uh, both good ideas about what should be done and, frankly, uh, warnings about bad ideas about what should not be done from representing a whole range of clients. I also did have the experience, as I said earlier, on public boards, and one of the most influential experiences was when I served on the Walmart board. Um, Sam Walton called me up one day and said, Hillary, my wife and my daughter think I need a woman on the board. <laughs> Would you do it? I said, well, well, I guess, Sam. I mean, I, I, sure, thanks, <laughs> hung up. Um, <laughs> but when I got into that experience, the way I watched him lead a board um, was to basically elicit as much information about what each of us, especially the independent directors, thought was going on in the world so that he could better tailor uh, what Walmart was doing to get even more customers, build more stores, and, and grow even uh, bigger. So I've watched a lot of people, and of course I watched you know, my husband first um, as uh, an attorney general and governor and then as a, a president. I mean, part of the reason your time here at Yale was so peaceful as it was during the Clinton administration. <laughs> so so I, my leadership style is really an accumulation of everything I've seen, I've learned, I've experienced, I've succeeded, I've failed. Um, and the, you know, the great uh, honor I had of representing uh, New York um, for eight years, you know, was uh, an extraordinary experience in leadership because, you know, eight months after I became senator, 9-11 happened. And watching how people dealt with that catastrophe, uh, the decisions that they made, the information that we had, which was oftentimes incomplete, sometimes inaccurate, um, was another great uh, set of lessons, and then serving as Secretary of State and having the kind of experience that Gina was describing as being a, uh, a secretary in the cabinet, in my case with 70,000 employees spread around the world, and trying to manage both the immediate and the urgent and figure out what was long-term and over the horizon uh, was a, a particularly um, you know, useful and eye-opening experience. So. Leadership for me has been kind of uh, accumulative because I've tried always to learn from what um, I have seen. And I will end, end though with this point. Obviously, I thought that's why I would have been a good president because I thought I'd learned a lot about leadership. But let me say this. What I did not learn is how to be a performer. And, you know, Partly it's because of who I am and my own personality. Partly it's because I'm a woman and I'm going places nobody's gone before. And partly is it's just not what I think is useful for a leader. I think a leader shows up, does the job, you know, does the work, brings people along, 
you know, tries to make the case. We are living, though, at a time right now when performative leadership is prevalent and I would argue very concerning. But that's where we are. And so that kind of leadership is, you know, very different from the kind of leadership I learned from and that I tried to practice over my uh, professional and public life. But I throw it out there because that's the era that we're in. If you've read anything about the front runner for the presidency of Argentina, if you haven't, read about it. It is pure performance. And performance is now actually substituting for production, accomplishment, results, and I'm not quite sure where that's going to take us. So I want to take two threads of this conversation, so I'm going to split them into two questions. So one, Secretary Marimondo, where you began about the question of women's leadership, because I cannot resist having the two of you up here. And I get this question all the time, because when you walk into my office, you will see a, a number of grim scenes of criminal punishment in the stained glass windows, along with the 16 male deans who preceded me. And there are two, one is a woman um, with a big mask on her face for being punished for talking too much. And right below is a woman being drowned as a witch. I greet them every morning, ladies, uh, when I come in. <laughs> but when students see that, they often turn to me and essentially say, how do you fit into this role that wasn't built for you and also be yourself? And I think I have a much easier job than either of you by an enormous margin. But one of the reasons is when I look at my four nearest predecessors, Robert Post, Tony Cronman, Harold Coe, Guido Calabresi, they're all remarkable leaders, but let's face it, they are so different. It's like four men walk into a bar. <laughs> and so I felt like there was a lot of space for me to be who I was as a woman leader, but I think that for the two of you, you are placed in almost impossibly difficult constraints. Even it's just hard to be yourself in politics, but also to be a woman who is herself in politics and still convey power. And yet both of you have done it. So I wonder, if you could just reflect with me a little bit about, about that, maybe uh, the woman who almost shattered the glass ceiling uh, should, should get first dibs on this question. You know, um, when you were talking about your four former predecessors, you know, it reminded me of when I used to try cases as a lawyer. There were so many different styles that male lawyers could employ. They could be the, you know, extraordinarily well-dressed, obviously in control kind of master of the universe. They could be the shambling, shambolic, barely dressed good guy that showed up to relate to the jury. I mean, it was everything from one side of the spectrum of behavior and appearance to the other. And I remember trying a lawsuit in Batesville, Arkansas, and we were, you know, in the middle, of, it was like a three-day trial. We were like maybe in the middle of the second day, as I recall, and we'd uh, broken for lunch. We came back, and in the front row of the small courtroom were about six men dressed in camouflage who had just come in from the deer woods. They'd been out in the woods and they came in for supplies. So I said to the bailiff before we got started, I said, who are they? What, they just showed up here? And they said, yeah, they came in for supplies. They heard a lady lawyer was trying a lawsuit. <laughs> They'd never seen a lady lawyer try a lawsuit. They kind of think it's like the dog who talks and they want to watch. Oh, no pressure. I mean, the, the margin for not just error, for acceptability is so narrow. Let's not even get into likability, whatever that is. Um, and, and so, you know, the preconceptions, the kind of, you know, presumptions about what a woman is supposed to be and how she's supposed to behave. And so I, I saw all of that in a courtroom in, you know, in real time about, you know, what I remember we were trying, my, one of my partners at the time was trying a lawsuit and he had a witness who came from California and she had very short hair. This was probably 19, 
I don't know, 82, 83, something like that. He made her go out and buy a wig because he said the jury will not be able to hear you. They will only be staring at your very short hair. So all of this is to say that you live with all of these assumptions, some of which you're not even aware of, and you're living your authentic life. You are the same person that you've always been, but people are projecting onto you like you're some walking Rorschach test that they are seeing their own lives, the lives of the women that they know. They're thinking about their mother, their wife, their daughter, and somehow you are embodying that when you are in the public arena for better or worse. And oftentimes you're not sure which it's going to be. Uh, so it still is a, a quite a, uh, a challenge. I mean, once you get into the job and you're doing the job, it's fine. And you know, when I was doing the job as Secretary of State and I left after four years, I had approval ratings of like 67%. But once I decided to run for president and to seek power, dare we say, authority on my own, it was relentless. Every you know, raised eyebrow, every smile, everything is you know, analyzed, dissected. So you just have to know that, and you just have to be prepared for that. And the final thing is what you were talking about with the, you know, the, the women being tried for speaking. Mary Beard wrote a great book about women in power, and she starts um, with the Odyssey, because here's poor Penelope who has held the kingdom together. And, you know, she comes down every morning, and she weaves all of her suitors are trying to get her attention so that they can try to get the kingdom because they assume Odysseus is not coming back and raises their son Telemachus and then Telemachus gets to be of age and he comes one day as she has come downstairs to assume her usual position and he goes mother go back upstairs talking is not for women so Mary Beard starts this book way in the past about what is expected and not expected from women. And so this is, you know, you, when you say good morning to the ladies, you know, remember that there are still people who would prefer that you not say anything. Well said. Very, very well said. So first let me say... I agree with everything that Hillary said, and it's all true. But still, we need more women in positions of leadership. <laughs> and so we have to stick with it, because the world will be better if more women are leaders, CEOs, presidents, etc. So we have to stick with it. The reality is it's harder, because the default is male. Right? If I ask you, you know, close your eyes, I'm going to say a few words, you know, general, you'll think of a man, president, you'll think of a man, you know, CEO, you'll probably think of a man, you'll probably think of a tall man, right? Uh, and when you say leadership, everything, is the default, what is likable, what is strong, the default is male, as defined, because that's who's always held the role. So if you are not that, you're somehow judged as less than, even though I think great leaders should be flexible, a great leader should be practical, a great leader should be willing to admit when he or she is wrong, willing to admit when you've made a mistake. Those are, in fact, signs of great leadership, and we have to embrace that and make room for that uh, in our vision of what a leader is. I will say it's very hard, and no one knows this better than Secretary Clinton, for women to be elective to executive positions. We have come around to figuring out how to elect women consistently to congressional positions, legislative positions. But when I was first elected governor of Rhode Island, there were four female governors in the country. I was one of two female Democratic governors. Maggie Hassan in New Hampshire and I were the only two women 
fem uh, Democratic governors. It is so, we still, of course, have not had a female president. So it is why? Why is that? I think it's because of this issue. People have become comfortable sending women to Congress because that's you know, legislative, you're not in charge, you're not a leader, you don't command a military, you're working on issues. It's more like maybe being a lawyer or an advocate, and they can get their head around that. But the top job, you have to be a leader, you have to be likable, which is defined as how men are likable. You have to be strong, but also likable. That's hard for women to be strong, but also nice and likable and compassionate. It's not hard for us to do it. It's hard for us to be seen as such. And so, uh, I'm, you know, every one, it's the same thing. Same thing, I'm sure you will agree with this. Every one of us gets, there's just something about her, right? What do you think of Governor Armando? She's really effective, but I don't know, there's just something about her. Or I'll never forget um, when I was running for re-election, I was never a particularly popular governor. It's interesting. I'm, I won my elections by big margins, but I was never very popular, uh, and which is true of most female governors, actually. If you, it's a fascinating thing. In any event, so we're trying to figure it out. So we did a focus group, and they asked the focus group, you know, what do you think of the governor? And they would say things like, she's created a lot of jobs. Unemployment is lower than it's ever been. We're fixing all the roads and bridges. So I was thinking, as I hear this, this is, I'm doing great. And then they're like, do you like her? Nah. <laughs> so then they put some pick, and then they said, why don't you like her? Like, what's wrong with her? One guy said, she's always in a business suit. <laughs> and so the pollster said, um, well, you know, she's the governor. Don't you think it'd be kind of strange if she went to work in jeans and a t-shirt? as the governor, and he's like, yeah, I guess you're right. So then they start putting photos of me on the table. Photo of me in a, in a suit, mm, in a dress, mm. then more casual clothes. And by the time they put a photo of me in khakis and a, like a, t -sh a shirt, they were like, yeah, you know, I could get, I could get used to her. I kind of like her. <laughs> because you're not threatening when you're in khakis and a t-shirt. So I will admit that that changed the way I was portrayed in a lot of my, you know, ads and such. And it works. So, it's, I know, be depressed, it's life. <laughs> so you can be depressed or you can win. So, like, <laughs> like let's just deal with it. Cause, so what's my point? My point is, Women in power scare people. We're scary because it's different. It's different. It's an image that's hard. And so what do we have to do? We have to find our own style of leadership. That's why I say commit yourself to the cause. Commit yourself to the people you serve. Because win or lose, you will, you will live a life of principle if you are a humble servant committed to your job. Find your authentic way of leading, but be deeply aware of the fact that it isn't fair, it is not a level playing field. Racism and sexism are alive and well, and we just have to keep going. We have to persist and stick with it. And, uh, you know, thankfully for me, people like Hillary have paved the way, and I mean that so sincerely. And hopefully I'm doing that for, you know, the next generation. But it's, it's more essential than ever, I think. Uh, I was just in China, and I was in one meeting, and they told me ahead of time, you know, you, you might not be taken seriously. I was the first Commerce Secretary in five years to be in China. And at one point, I was sitting at the meeting, and it's translated, so you have a few minutes to sit and just look. And it was me and 27 men. Every meet, then I took note, every meeting was like that. Me and dozens of men. And I, I've been, I was asked in an interview when I came home, was your gender an asset or a liability? I said, definitely a liability. I turned it around, of course. When I left, the reports after was, um, Ramondo was a strong figure. That was in their reporting on me. 
But you know, I'm not, you don't, don't pretend it wasn't a liability, but it doesn't mean you can't be effective because you can be. Well, you know, Madeleine Albright used to say when she would be the only woman, particularly in the Middle East, um, but also I've had the same meetings in China where there are no other women. She said, you know, I got to feel like they were treating me like an honorary man. They couldn't, <laughs> I, they couldn't accept the fact that I was a woman Secretary of State, but I was representing the United States. So I was kind of an honorary man. And uh, you know, I showed up in one country one time for one of those meetings, and um, they were notoriously always all men. And um, I sit down, and, and I had this very pleasant surprise. You know, the foreign minister is sitting across from me and two other ministers. And then there's like these young women. I thought, this is great. And then the foreign minister starts by saying, I understand you like to help women. So I went around and found women who work here and I brought them so they would sit at the table with me. You know, but that was the way he was thinking like, well, how can I make her feel good that, you know, we're gonna do something for women. So uh, Secretary Clinton, I wanna pick up on something that you were talking about, which is how performative our politics have become. And it's, it's from top to bottom, uh, but uh, I think there's a younger generation coming onto the stage that grew up during COVID and social media. And you know, I always pound the table when the one else come and say, lawyers are problem solvers. We don't sit on the sidelines and jeer, we solve problems. And I wonder, at this moment in time, do you have faith in the ability of our politics uh, in, uh, to solve problems? I mean, it's a tough, time out there, I don't need to tell either one of you, but I wonder how are you thinking about this incredibly polarized moment where performative politics succeed as they do? How do you just get things done? And so maybe I'll start with um, you, Secretary Clinton. Well, I, I think we had a, a you know, perhaps um, welcome sign um, that Jim Jordan, who's nothing but a performative politician, has never has never passed a single piece of legislation, was rejected, both in public, which took some guts on the part of some of the Republicans to do that in public, but even more dramatically in private when they had a secret ballot um, in his bid for the speakership. But when you ask, do I worry about um, whether we can solve problems? Yes, I worry endlessly, again, to quote my good friend, Madeleine Albright, uh, when she was asked after writing a book called Fascism, whether she was an optimist, she said, yes, I'm an, I'm an optimist who worries a lot. And so <laughs> I'm kind of in that camp. Um, I, you know, it is going to be very challenging to turn the tide on this kind of uh, performance-based uh, politics, which we are in the midst of, and it's not just in our country. Um, and and I, I think that young people who are more um, adept with social media perhaps can uh, figure out ways to limit the impact of what social media portrays, because it is a um, fuel for performative politics. And we are seeing that in many settings. We're seeing, you know, just a recent article, I think in the last day or two, the main sources of uh, uh, news now are obviously social media sites. That's where most people, not just the United States, but in the world get their news. And if you look at the sites that are the leading quote, unquote, news sites on, you know, X, formerly Twitter, um, they are, you know, they're advocacy sites. They, they make no uh, pretense, but most people can't see that, can't understand it, can't penetrate it. So I am, you know, uh, deeply uh, concerned. Um, and it, it is, you know, for me, um, a, we have a perfect uh, comparison. You know, we have a current president who's gotten a lot done, who has great people like Gina Raimondo working for him, who get up every day and try to make America more competitive or safer or more energy independent. They have agendas and missions and they are performing in a practical results-oriented way, not in a 
kind of social media driven uh, way. Um, but then people go, oh yeah, that's kind of boring. You know, passing infrastructure and starting advanced manufacturing so we do semiconductor factories in the United States again and accelerating our clean energy transition. Yeah, that's really nice, but it's boring. And why is it boring? Because the contrast is entertaining, even if it's frightening. And so honestly, Heather, I think we have a lot at stake in whether we can, in a kind of mature way, uh, reject politicians who are only about entertainment and performance. You can have differences of opinion, and my gosh, we have a lot of them. What are the best ways to do you know, the following you know, 10 things? We can have those kind, I would, I would yearn for those conversations to come back. You know, I know a lot of the people I serve with in the Senate on the Republican side who are still there know better. I hear them say things, I watch them do things. These are people I worked with, I traveled with, and I know they know better. But they are caught in the grip of this kind of psychic change about what politicians are expected to do if you're on a certain uh, side of the aisle. And so I think you've got to take it seriously and we have to reward people who do th get things done and are thinking about the common good and make tough decisions. And hopefully we can get back to having a two-party system where both sides are uh, equally uh, willing to have a base of evidence and facts and then argue about them and what are the best decisions to make uh, based on them. Secretary Member. Well said. Well said. Of course, I also share those worries and worry deeply for our democracy and the strength of our democracy. Uh, which rests upon a foundation of a free press and a well-educated, well-informed population. Um, I saw even in my time as governor, the, just in the six, six and a half years I served, our local newspaper and the local newspapers really struggled. You know, they're a shell of their former selves. It's, it's very difficult to govern. As much as we complain about the press, it's very difficult to govern without a strong, active, free press. Uh, so yes, I worry. Uh, it's absolutely true. You, we need a free press to get into, question us, hold us accountable, and tell the truth and the facts. And so we all should pay, pay more attention to that and ask ourselves, what can we do? Because the, uh, democracy cannot be sustained without a stronger, uh, open press and cannot be sustained with this level of income inequality. These are two fundamental problems that everyone in here should ask yourself, what can you do to shore up and the press and reduce income inequality? Bring up the bottom uh, because we will not have a democracy unless we deal with both of those issues. Having said that, you say the, some problems are impossible to solve. You know, I'm, I am more hopeful, okay? And I'm in it every day. So I understand, I, de I deal with Jim Jordan daily. I deal with these Republicans and I'm in the thick of it, I am in the soup. So I am not naive, but I am hopeful. Be first of all, you have to be. It's too important, we're not going to give up. Resolve to not give up. Resolve to reclaim what we must and to fight for our democracy. It is still the greatest country in the world. I travel all over the world and yes, our ability to lead the world is compromised because of what's happening in our country. It is embarrassing what's happening in our politics and in Congress. But the world depends on us to strengthen ourselves so we can lead. So I don't think solving these problems is impossible. It's harder and it's a dark moment. We will get through this to the other side. But I will say in my short time in Washington, you know, when I took the job, people said, oh, you can't get anything done. 
in Washington, bipartisanship is dead. But under the president's leadership, we passed on a bipartisan basis the largest infrastructure investment in our country's history. Bipartisan. So you have to have hope. You know, the, the work that I led uh, passing the Chips for America Act, Chips and Science Act, bipartisan. Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schu and um, Mitch McConnell both voted for the CHIPS Act. You know, so we have to look for the good, stick with it. Be pers now is the time to persist. Now is the time not to give up. And I don't see this as impossible. The, yeah, it's harder than it should be, and a lot of bad things are happening. But I am hopeful that we will move to a place of a stronger democracy, more equal opportunity, and solving the problems that need to be solved. Because we have to, we have to stick with it until that is the case. What is amazing is that you just answered that what I was going to make the last question, which is what gives you hope. And so maybe I'll let Secretary Clinton bring us home. Well, I could not agree more um, with Gina. And I actually think the last two years, um, with the passage of this legislation, much of which had been talked about but never realized over a number of years, um, should give us hope that it is possible. If people um, are focused on uh, their mission, they have goals that they are aiming toward, they bring people together. I, I don't know how many meetings Gina must have had about the Chips and Science uh, Act, but countless meetings that where you did listen and you did uh, change legislation to reflect concerns that people had. All of that shows that we can actually get something done uh, that is in keeping uh, with uh, our uh, values. and. There is no country better positioned for the future than the United States. And really, the only thing standing in our way is ourselves. You know, we have met the enemy and it is us, uh, the old Pogo cartoon. And so, therefore, we got to get out of our own way. And frankly, we have to get some uh, people who claim to be leaders who are not leading um, out of the way so that we can have a... Uh, a consensus again where we can work on a bipartisan uh, basis where people are willing to uh, come together and listen and yes compromise which is not a dirty word but is the essential you know outcome of so much democratic uh, debate and uh, dialogue between people so I too remain optimistic worrying but optimistic and I also believe uh, that we have to produce results and you know we have the climate crisis staring us in the face income inequality staring us in the face you know american leadership amidst you know war conflict and all kinds of other challenges the refugee migration crisis which will continue to get worse because of climate change we have big problems that will determine you know not just our politics but the quality of our lives uh in much of the world so uh, I think it is a time for mature leadership, for people who want to roll their sleeves up, uh, as the Biden administration has shown us. It has modeled that kind of mature leadership. And I just want people to say, isn't that exciting? <laughs> oh my gosh, we have a president who gets up and goes to the office and talks about helping the Ukrainians and dealing with, you know, our competition with China and oh my gosh, I find that thrilling. And yes, it's so entertaining and I'm going to be supportive of it. So yes, that's what I hope we do. Yeah, okay, so I'll, I'll finish this out here. Um, to quote your husband, one of the things he said, which I love, there's nothing wrong about America that can't be fixed by what's right about America. That was true then and it's true now. So I will end with a call to action for everybody here. And I asked Heather if any students were here, if you are here. Uh, people say to me, should I do public service? Should I run for office? My answer is absolutely. What you say is true. 
our politics has never been worse. But it is also true that it's never mattered more that good people raise their hand and are willing to serve. Because whether it's climate, income inequality, competition, whatever, what I know is this. These problems are hard to address. They will not be solved if you don't get in the game in some way. That's a fact. There are plenty of performers, to use your phrase, raising their hand every day. And it will make it worse. So you have to ask yourselves, what are you going to do about it? And I mean you, every one of you. You could run for school committee. You could get behind a candidate you believe in. You could start a local newspaper. You could do something in your neighborhood. You could run for Senate. You could do whatever you want to do. But you cannot bury your head in the sand and get disgusted by it all. Because then it won't get fixed. You with me? It's, it's, I'm dead, I am deadly serious about this. Every one of these problems is fixable if we decide to fix them. And they will not be fixed if we sit on the sidelines, complain, are somewhat apathetic, just pursue our own career. Well, you know, first I got to pay back my loans, and then I have to do this, and then I got to get the kids through college. Yeah, okay, fine. You can do, you can serve and do those things in whatever way is comfortable for you. But I would say it's um, if this is a moment that everyone has to ask themselves, what am I going to do to make this country better and this democracy stronger and fix this politics so we can get back to the business of solving these problems and exactly what Secretary Clinton is saying. And do I think we're going to get there? Yeah, I do. But I really hope on your drive home or your flight home, you ask yourself what you're going to do. Because if you get in the game, it will be a better, brighter future. So I, I cannot imagine a better capstone to uh, this reunion. And I, I just want to say, Secretary Raimondo, as I said to uh, this room earlier today, when people ask me, what is the mission of Yale Law School? I say this generation is inheriting impossible problems to solve, and our job is to train a generation to solve them. And you, too, have embodied that spirit in a way that makes us so proud, and it is an honor to have you here. I am so grateful on behalf of everyone here that you shared this time with us, and please join me in saying thank you very much. <laughs>